Well, here we are. We're back to this again. This is a new year. It's a new season. So we're going to start a new series today. After all, it's the season of starting new things, isn't it? New Year's is that season when most people start doing some reflecting. You know, they kind of think about the years behind and often make resolutions about the future. This tradition of making changes to the course of one's life has a lot to do with the philosophy of getting the most out of life. It's kind of that recognition that although our lives may be pretty good, there's always room to improve them. There's always something, it seems, that could be, well, maybe just a little bit better. Maybe you've made some resolutions already this year. Perhaps it was a decision to spend more time alone with God, or maybe you decided you wanted to lose some weight, or get more exercise, or learn something new this year. Maybe you decided that you want to eat a little healthier. I've tried that. <laughs> or spend more time with the people that matter most to you. I like doing that. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we can change if we're looking to get the most out of life. But the truth is, we've had a pretty rough year, haven't we? So challenging, in fact, that many of us are having a really tough time even considering a New Year's resolution. I mean, how do we get the most out of life when we're starting the new year back in lockdown? I mean, why would any of us be thinking about getting the most out of life when a whole lot of us are just trying to come up with ideas of how to get anything out of life right now? As I was wrestling with that thought, I did what I often do. I went to my Bible and I opened it up to one of my favorite books, which is the book of Ephesians, which, by the way, is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote while he was under house arrest, in isolation, going through something that was probably an awful lot like what we're going through right now. And in that letter, he said something that takes this idea of getting the most out of life and it opens it up to something so much bigger. See, in Ephesians 4, in verse 1, Paul says this. He says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And when I read that, it hit me. That's what we need to be talking about. We don't need to be talking about how to get the most out of life, because getting the most out of life really only has one focus, me. I mean, at its core, it's selfish and self-centered. It's all about satisfying and gratifying me. It does nothing to improve life itself. See, I believe that we don't just want to have better. We want to be better. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be going through the book of Ephesians and unpacking some of the things that the Apostle Paul wrote while in isolation, in lockdown, so to speak, so that we can learn a little bit more about how to get the worth out of life. So today, I want to begin uh, by reading to you from Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 3 to 6, which says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. You know, when we talk about getting the worth out of life, it's really important that we know who we are and where we're coming from. I mean, after all, the starting point of any journey determines so much about the journey itself, doesn't it? Now, even in such a small passage of Scripture, there's a lot here that we could talk about, but I want to zero in on one very specific thing that Paul says. You see, in verse 4, he talks about our adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. And I want to talk about that adoption today because this is about 
our identity. And there are few things that are more important than our identity in Christ. Who you are shapes how you will live. Now, have you ever wondered what God thinks of you? And I mean you specifically, personally. Do you ever wonder what he thinks about you? Is it sometimes hard for you to believe that he loves you as much as the Bible says he does? If it is, then, you know, maybe there's something in this message of adoption that you might need to hear. You see, Paul uses the language of adoption a lot. You find it all throughout Ephesians. And he even uses the same word that he uses in Ephesians in the book of Romans. In chapter 8, verse 15 and 16, for example, he says, For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, which is, Abba is an Aramaic expression for father that denotes kind of a, a deep affection and familiarity that an adult child would greet their father with, kind of like saying dad. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, when you hear that, what does it mean to you that you have received that spirit of adoption? I mean, children of God is not some slogan. Remember, the church isn't a club. It's not an organization. It's Definitely not just a self-help group or support group of some kind designed to make you feel good about yourself. You see, in the scriptures, the church is described as the body of Christ. So what does it mean to you to know that you have been adopted? To know that you are a child of God? How does it make you feel to know that he's adopted you? Does it encourage you? Does it overwhelm you? Inspire you? What does it do in your heart to know that you've received a spirit of adoption, making you his child? Because I believe that there is a heart response here that we should all have. So let me tell you about a few things that I know and I see about the spirit of adoption. One of those things is that the spirit of adoption communicates belonging. You know, being chosen and accepted by someone in just about any context affirms a close relationship. It, it says, I want that person in my life. It says, we belong together. And in this case, even more so. It says that God has singled you out. He's chosen you as you are, to be brought into his house and loved as one of his own. Now, speaking about the church, 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, I've never been adopted per se, but I do know what it feels like to not belong. I mean, when I was living in the streets, for example, I wasn't, it wasn't just that I had nowhere to go. I had no one to go to. I had a deep, kind of unrelenting pain inside myself, a feeling of being unwanted, so deep and unshakable that eventually I began to accept the approval of, well, anyone, no matter what the cost. And it almost killed me, literally. When I first discovered Jesus and was beginning to learn about this adoption, I was skeptical. At first, I didn't know if I could trust what I was hearing or what I was seeing, for that matter. But I wasn't the first to be adopted into his family. So there were many others, people just like me and just like you, who had also been brought into this family of God, who showed me that I belonged. They affirmed me. They, 
demonstrated to me my belonging. They loved me without judgment. They helped me without expectation. They stood by me even when I was screwing up. And no matter what my life had been before, they treated me with respect and love. And something inside me changed. Through the love they demonstrated, the spirit of adoption showed me that I belonged in the family of God. The spirit of adoption communicates belonging. So once I had it, I too began to communicate that same belonging to others. We who have been given so much have so much to share. If you have it, and you know it, then you need to share it. So show people around you the love that you've been shown. Love without judgment. Help others without expectation. Stand by each other, even when the people around you mess up. And I would suggest, especially when the people around you mess up. Communicate a sense of belonging as the spirit of adoption has done for you. Another thing I know about the spirit of adoption is that it also conveys value and worth. We are special. I mean, that's the bottom line, really. If there's anything that God has made perfectly clear, it's that we are incredibly important to him. Just a little further into Ephesians, when you get into chapter 2, in verse 10 it says, We are God's masterpiece. Those are his words. It's a way that he chooses to describe us. His greatest creation. We are his masterpiece. We're told in Romans that we are heirs to his kingdom. We're told elsewhere in Ephesians that we are dearly loved by him. First John tells us that the spirit within us is greater than the spirit in the world. You are not only children of God and Jesus, you were chosen by God through Jesus. He looked down upon this earth and saw you and said, I want that one. That one's mine. God called you out. He chose you because you have great value and worth to him. From before the time we were born, any of us, we were all destined for greater things than just getting through this life in one piece. When Paul encourages us to live a life worthy of the calling we've received, we have to know that that calling has eternal weight and value. You know, when we talk in the church about living to serve, We're talking about serving for the glory of God Almighty. When we talk about living humbly or demonstrating peace or patience, kindness, etc., we're talking about living in such a way as to promote God's magnificence through the power of his Spirit. In fact, all of God's kingdom things that we're learning about in the church are about the increase of Jesus in this world. They are the eternal. And they exist to bring glory to God. The life that we live in him has immense value and worth. But how he feels about us is even greater. I mean, this this is really the part of the message in any message where I start talking about the prodigal son again. I mean, I know at this point you're all going, oh, here he goes again, right? I know I talk about it all the time, but I really feel that this is the greatest illustration of how much value and worth we have in the eyes of God. In the story, Jesus describes the younger of two sons going to his father and asking for an inheritance. And then he takes that money and he runs. I mean, he takes off to a foreign land and he blows it all in wild living. And after losing everything, And living with nothing for a time, the son comes to realize that even the servants in his father's home live with more than he has. And so he returns home with the intention of humbling himself before his father and admitting his failure, saying that he understands that he has no worth. But when his father sees him coming, 
he's so happy to see his son that he doesn't wait for the son to return. No, he runs out to meet the son while the son is still a long way off. The son hasn't apologized yet. He hasn't made any kind of amends. He certainly hasn't accomplished any great work for his father to make everything okay. All he's done is come home. And the father runs to him, throws his arms around him and kisses him. The father clothes the son in riches and places the family ring on his finger, restoring him to his full status in the home. I particularly love how when the older son questions the fuss his father is making, his response is, My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. We have great value and worth in the eyes of God. And it has nothing to do with anything that we've done, good or bad. It's not something we can earn. It has nothing to do with any accomplishments or lack thereof. It has everything to do with who he is and what he has done. His spirit of adoption conveys value and worth because, well, that's who he is. What we need to remember is that everyone he adopts has a different story. I mean, we're all coming from different places and we all have different starting points. For some, it may take longer than it does for others for the spirit of adoption to you know, penetrate the walls that we tend to build up inside ourselves in this life. So show people that they're special. Be intentional about it. Show them that they have value. Treat them as though they have worth, because they do. Remind them not only that God loves them, but that you love them too. Encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ so that they too will know without question that they are value, valuable and that they have great worth in the eyes of God. Just as the spirit of adoption conveys value and worth to you, so you too should convey that same value and worth to others. Now, the last thing I want to make sure we talk about today is that the spirit of adoption also creates in us a deep sense of confidence. It creates a deep sense of confidence. And confidence comes from knowing something for sure. I mean, it usually is something that's been tested and proven you know, when I say that I have confidence that I can no longer do a handspring into a backflip, it's because the last time I tried anything like that, I discovered that my body weight exceeds my arm, shoulder, and joint strength, to say nothing about a significant deficit in my balance and coordination. But in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 and 39, the Apostle Paul wrote this. He said, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is huge. That means that there is nothing you can do to make God love you anymore. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less. He will always love you fully and completely with a heart bigger than anything you know. He will always be there for you to walk with you through anything that this world would throw at you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you, and you'll never be alone. You are not just another person scrambling to be something in this world. You are a child of a perfect father. You are princes 
and princesses in the greatest of kingdoms. You are a child of God, created in his likeness. You have great purpose. You were created to be unique, not better than each other, but unique. You were created to live in honor and glory for God. You were born to lead. You were born to teach. You were born to live not just a life, but a great life. And knowing that should build confidence. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul says about Jesus that in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Now, my kids approach me all the time. And let me tell you about confident. They'll ask me for anything. If it pops in their head, I'm sure it'll come out of their mouth. They'll ask me for outrageous things sometimes, like chocolate bars before bed or donuts for supper. I mean, they don't, they've got no filter almost. I even remember once many years ago, my daughter Crystal asking me if she could have all the girls from her grade four class over for a sleepover. Yeah, that didn't happen. But the point is, is my kids will ask me for all kinds of things because of the confidence they have in their relationship with me. The confidence they have, you understand, has nothing to do with the things they ask for. The confidence comes from the relationship. You see, my kids also had a friend who used to live near us, and he would come over and ring the doorbell all the time. And he never once asked for a single unreasonable thing that I can think of. But every time he came to that door, he was super nervous to ask me for anything. I mean, whatever he was going to ask me, even though it was usually just that the kids would go out and play out in the fresh air. He had no confidence to approach me because he had no relationship with me. The spirit of adoption that Paul writes about creates in us a deep sense of confidence born out of the relationship that we have with the Father. We can be confident Because through the spirit of adoption, he is our father. We know that we can approach him. We know that he will listen. We know because the spirit of adoption creates in us a deep sense of confidence about these things. But more than that, it also gives us confidence with the rest of our lives too. Just like how my own children will walk with confidence when I bring them to new places in this world, so we too can walk with confidence in all the places we'll go, knowing that our Father is there with us, wherever we may be. So, just as the spirit of adoption creates confidence in us, we too should encourage others to remind them of this confidence we have. My kids need reassuring sometimes. I need reminding sometimes. But that, be that for each other. Remind each other what the Spirit is that we have within us. Remind us who He really is. Encourage each other to have the confidence and to remember who it is that has adopted us into His family. We have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God.